Good morning. I can hear by the silence that settled that the microphones are working. So welcome everyone to the opening of the EMEA 2022 annual conference. This is a much anticipated moment and a moment which we kept dreading might not happen in real life after all, as we've had to write off so many real encounters in, over these past years. But welcome everyone here in Tartu and welcome to those of you also who are joining us on, in space and online. So let me for once begin by thanking everyone, and this is not, not, not quite in character for me to begin with all these thank yous, but I will allow myself to do that today. First of all, of course, to the National uh, Museum of Estonia, who offered to host this conference and award ceremony at a really difficult point of time, with the COVID-19 pandemic still an unpredictable factor, um, and to which is now added this un anticipated factor of yet another intra-European war, which some people thought we had left behind and would not see again. In 2018, the Estonian National Museum was the EMF board's surprising choice for the Ken Hudson Award. Surprising because Ken Hudson was a persistent critic of national museums, which he tended to find static and stiff, too full of themselves and too full of inertia to be innovative. But the new Estonian National Museum had made significant choices in the exact opposite direction. The location, the choice of building and pioneering architecture, and most importantly, a set of inclusive dialogue-based working methods representing a consistent engagement with the population and diverse communities of Estonia in exploring what a nation can be and what a national museum could be. For us, the Estonian National Museum has proved to be the most competent, flexible, and professional partner one could wish for. As always, I want to thank our Stedford partners, the Council of Europe, Mavert, Event, the Sileto Trust, the Municipality of Portimao, and you'll meet representatives from most of these over the next couple of days. I want to acknowledge the EMF board, the national correspondents, who anchor us across the width of Europe, and not least, of course, the EMEA jury. And here I would like in particular to thank Marlene Molio, who has chaired the jury through these two challenging corona years, but who can unfortunately not be with us here today due to a recent accident. Marlene, along with judges Metka Fuis, and there you are, and Christophe Dufour are leaving the jury now as they've come to the end of their six years tenure. I want to thank Afsan al who's leaving after having boosted our online presence immensely, and thank the three veteran judges who stepped in this year, Atle Fay, Michael Ryan, and Jose Camero. Um, I want to welcome judges, Judge Amina Kravavats as a new chair of the jury, and welcome Dominika Krusiniak, Friedrich von Bose, Matthew Vukovil, and Beat Hechler as new judges. I want also to acknowledge our Russian colleagues who are absent, our Russian judges and the NCs and the three candidate museums who are barred from participating in this EMEA meeting and award ceremony through the sanctions imposed by the EMF board, which came into effect May 1st, as the Russian military invasion of Ukraine is ongoing with no solution in sight. Museums are, for better or worse, part of society and cannot claim a raison d'etre outside it. And while even, this is a little emotional because, um, yeah, uh, even temporarily barring our Russian colleagues feels like an amputation of an essential part of ourselves. And while we are aware that sanctions do not always hurt where they should, this exclusion is the instrument which we as an organization have through which to express our protest. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so emotional on this. So, in 2021, 60 museum candidates and a determined, efficient and tenacious EMEA jury defied museum lockdowns and closed borders to complete yet another interesting season of the EMEA Awards. The EMEA Awards are clearly distinguished from other museum and heritage award schemes by the explicit commitment to the values of citizenship, democracy and human rights, to sustainability and to bridging cultures and social and political borders. 
The six different awards which we now give out highlight different aspects and dimensions of these values and this social humanitarian anchoring that has been shaped not least by our close relationship with the Council of Europe, which goes back to the origin of the awards in 1977. Awarded continuously over four and a half decades, the EMEA Award Scheme responds to long-term societal changes as well as current urgent social issues and reflects the challenges, obligations and opportunities which museums face in the 21st century. How these values evolve and interpreted over time is the dynamic undercurrent running through museum innovation these year. The past two years, with extensive periods close to the public, has been a period that calls for critical self-reflection among museum professionals. These are complex and conflicted times, and the celebration of the potential of museums has had to be balanced and tempered by critical self-assessment. Many museums increase their online and their outdoor presence. Some museums across Europe develop meaningful new functions and new ways of placing their empty buildings, their multi-purpose facilities and underutilized resources at the service of their communities. One of the candidate museums, uh, the EMEA candidate museums, became an essential part of the regional pandemic infrastructure as it grew into a major vaccination center where, as they say, people could enjoy the archaeological collections and listen to live piano concerts while waiting in line for their shots. At the core of Ken Hudson's contentious and somewhat polemic concept of public quality, which has remained central for the EMEA Awards, is the basic claim and the basic promise that museums are there to meet, address, and serve the needs of the public. Year after year, candidate and winners of the EMEA Awards demonstrate that the ability to identify and to meet real needs in museums' communities depends more on how a museum defines and interprets its purpose and its skills and its willingness to listen than it depends on the nature of the collection or the scale of its resources. To become relevant or to remain relevant, to function as a gathering point, a point of reference and orientation for their communities, museums are increasingly aware of their obligations to address the urgent current issues of their time and place. The accelerating climate change, the escalating destruction of nature and exploding loss of biodiversity constitute one such major field of crisis that museums can no longer avoid or ignore. The tension and conflicts of social injustice and the absurdly growing local, regional and global inequalities in power and opportunities in wealth, welfare and well-being is another such urgent area. There is no general blueprint of strategies, no defined list of topics or themes, no set of prescribed methods for honoring these social obligations. It's rather an overall perspective that comes into place most convincingly when tapping into each museum's particular strengths and reflecting its particular context and its particular collections, topographies and demographics. Year after year, candidate museums also underscore that a thorough museum innovation calls for a complete and integrated metamorphosis involving and transforming all aspects of the museum from mission policies and governance to collections, documentation and exhibitions. The multifaceted processes of creating new museums or reinventing existing ones provide windows into current trends and the near future of museums. Reimagining a future museum entails a critical perspective on the origin and the past practices that have shaped the museum, the individual museum, as well as the museum as a paradigm. This critical perspective includes detecting where and how traditional blind spots of power and privilege may now thwart and obstruct current egalitarian, inclusive and participatory intentions and efforts. So, to round up for me now, for EMEA and EMF, it's important that the particular experience, knowledge and skills of the winners of a given year are not just showcased fleetingly and momentarily, but transmitted and retained over the years. 
the annual conferences are occasions for direct contact between candidate museums, but you will also meet former winners who return now to join us as panelists, speakers, workshop leaders. This year, for the first time, the annual candidate and winners brochures are available in a full digital format, and we hope this and the archives on the EMF website will serve to facilitate subsequent contact among you and to preserve and develop some of the substance of the innovative processes we'll hear of. Welcome, and I wish you the best and most productive few days here, and thank you once again. Thank you, Jette. I am Gertu Sachs, the director of the National Museum here, and I would just you know, like, you, like to welcome you briefly. Dear colleagues, dear guests, Estonian National Museum is proud to welcome you at EMIA conference and ceremony. Despite all odds, COVID and security crisis in Europe, you are here, you are safe, and we are ready to make you feel like at home. Our museum is a home to us, and now we offer it to you. Home is a significant concept, the place where you should feel protected. The concept that we have unfortunately not been able to take for granted here in the past and the millions cannot take for granted now in Ukraine. These are the, the days that bring so many parallels with the times all of us here know and remember very well the times of the Soviet occupation. Today we welcome you at our beautiful and rather new building. It was opened in 2016, but the Estonian National Museum was created already in 1909. Today we have peace and safety here, but at the end of the Second World War, when the staff of the museum was packing rapidly all the objects and exhibits just across the valley here on our grounds, in the beautiful building of Radi Manor House, where our collections were situated then, one of the researchers responsible for this ev evacuation, Gustav Rank, wrote in his diary. 2nd of March, 1944. Everything is out of order, as it might have been only when the museum moved to Radi in the first years of the Estonian independence. This will make a large hole in the research and study work, as both require systemized material. So adieu, Estonian ethnology, for a while. We pack and pack and tear apart everything that we have built so hopefully for the last 20 years. Only now we recognize the mistakes that were made during the time of peace. First of all, creating an airfield and setting up the army quarters just by the side of the university town have been madness. Why couldn't these military facilities have been somewhere far? Now we have to live in constant fear that all these cultural treasures in Tartu will one day perish in the battles of the war. The quote ends. The evacuation in 1944 was successful and most of the museum collections were saved. But the museum building just across the valley here was completely destroyed. Gustav Rank himself had to flee to Sweden with his family where he had to live for the rest of his life. Many of his colleagues weren't so lucky. They either died here or were sent to Siberia. None of the Estonians wanted or expected that. Our Ukrainian colleagues surely did not want or expect to be 
in the similar situation today. That is why gatherings as we have here this week with you all are extremely important. The work that the museums do every day, the knowledge that we offer has power in these circumstances. And one of the tasks of a modern museum is to offer the sense of well-being to our public. We have possibilities to tell tales of coming through and surviving any kind of difficult times. And this gives solace and can be a beacon. This might be a reason why we see our visitor numbers growing these days. Three days of interesting presentations and panels are ahead and we have planned something for all your evenings as well. But please also find time to visit our museum and exhibitions. If you want to meet uh, our colleagues of any specific field of the museum work, please approach our ticket sales counter and uh, we will find these contacts for you. On Saturday, they will also be guided to us to, difficult, to different parts of our museum. Maybe not so difficult, but different. <laughs> Please find this information in the programme. Uh, and lastly, I would sincerely like to thank all the organisers. The European Museum Forum, EMIA, thank you, Jette. And of course, the dear, dear colleagues in, in, in our museum who have made it uh, possible. Um, and I would like to thank all the presenters in advance as well. Thank you all for being here and I wish you fruitful conference and many memorable moments. Thank you. Agnes, do we continue now? Yeah. So, um, me again. Um, except it isn't really. It was supposed to be Mark O'Neill who was supposed to be here. But unfortunately, he can't be here. So I'm now trying to channel Mark and speak in his voice, which is not very easy for me. Um, so I'll be introducing the Nano Nagler place. Um, yeah. The Council of Europe is dedicated to upholding human rights and democratic citizenship and has been a partner of EMIA since its foundation in 1977. The Council of Europe Museum Prize is selected from a short list of three from each year's candidates provided by the EMIA jury and is announced already in December. This year, the Committee of Culture, Science, Education and Media of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe awarded the prize to Neno Nagler Place in Cork, Ireland. Neno Nagler Place meets the criteria of the Council of Europe Prize through its explicit and active inclusive policy, which aims at bridging cultures, overcoming social and political borders, and at providing links between historic and contemporary issues. The current radically inclusive engagement work of the museum is not a revival or an innovation. It's a direct continuation of the original impulses to care for the excluded, which led to the founding of a school and a convent dedicated to serving the poor more than 250 years ago. A deep commitment to hospitality towards the other pervades the museum, which asks visitors explicitly what do you choose to do? And I'll step out of mark a little and just be myself and say that uh, last week I had the pleasure of being part of the ceremony in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg when the prize was given to the Nanonagle place. Um, and to, to hear firsthand from you this museum, which continued to reinvent and renew itself to develop new practices, new areas of focus, while remaining true to these basic values of serving its constituents, its commitment to caring for the underprivileged, the excluded, the disenfranchised, and supporting them towards agency, whether their vulnerability is rooted in old-fashioned poverty, in contemporary forced exile, or in more personal and individual factors. 
And I'm really looking forward to hearing you again today. And I don't know how you intend, to, do you all want to come up here or how do you want to do this? Forward on the green Bring and backwards it. on the red. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, Jada, thank you so much for the lovely welcome. And um, we, we had a, an amazing week in, in Strasbourg, and it's amazing to be to be here. Um, my name is Shane Clark. I'm the CEO of Nano Nagel Place, Cork, Ireland, as mentioned. And I'm here with my uh, marvelous uh, colleagues. Um, Nano Nagel Place is, as I hope will become evident in the presentation, essentially an urban village. And as such, it's only appropriate that I share the building here with my brilliant colleague, uh, Dr. Danielle O'Donovan, who will do much of the heavy lifting and indeed basically wrote what, uh, what is before us here today. Uh, and our plan is to, tra uh, to trace a narrative from the 18th century in Cork to the 21st century, from the local to the global. And it's to show how Nano Nagel's radical uh, vision of education and social justice is made real in today's world. We want to show uh, that our religious uh, built heritage can be regenerated to community purpose and to celebrate living heritage and a continuity of community. I think I press. Um, last week, our team, including the Presentation Sisters, uh, which Nano Nago founded, and the uh, Lord uh, Mayor of Cork City travelled to Strasbourg uh, to receive the Council of Europe Museum Prize 2022. The prize exemplifies museums that have contributed to human rights and democratic cit uh, citizenship. And my colleague Danielle will take the story all the way back to the 18th century. Oops, is this one? Uh, so if you saw me uh, at breakfast with a PowerPoint, that was me working between 12 and 6 to get the PowerPoint working. So I want you all to hold your breath and make sure <laughs> we get there. So at Nano Nago Place, we use the story of a valiant woman and the many remarkable women who followed her in her footsteps to inspire people to change the world in the present. Um, Nano Nago was born into a wealthy Catholic family in 1718. And thanks to that wealth, she could have chosen to do nothing. But instead, she chose to uh, move to the South Parish of Cork City, an area where a contemporary uh, commentator described the doorways as thronged with poor children. She proceeded to establish seven schools, five for girls, her focus was girls, and two for boys. She taught the children how to read, how to work, and how to pray. Three skills that she knew would allow them to empower themselves. In the evenings, she went out into the laneways and the garrets of Cork City to visit the poor and the sick, carrying her lantern to light the way. Essentially, she set up our education and outreach department in circa 1754, which I do understand is an unfair advantage. Nano addressed urgent local issues and said that if she could be of service anywhere in the world, she would gladly do all in her power, suggesting that she had a global vision too. And that is the heritage of Nano Nagel Place. Oh, the most re um, remarkable thing um, is that her schools were secret. They were run in secret. And um, they were con as they were contravened by the penal laws, which withdrew many rights from anyone who did not conform to the established religion, including the vast majority of the population who were Roman Catholic. So Nano made <clears throat> a point of breaking those laws on a very regular basis. Not only did she operate seven schools, catering for hundreds of children, she invited the Ursuline sisters to come from Paris to Cork to help her and established an illegal convent for them. Nano is not yet recognised as a feminist icon, but she was fearless and she was radical, um, ignoring the instructions of the local bishop and priest when they tried to get her to change her plans. Um, in 1775, Nano founded her own religious congregation, the Presentation Sisters, who were unbound by the rule of enclosure, meaning that they could leave the convent uh, to educate the poor and to care for the sick. 
The Presentation Sisters spread across Ireland and then across the world, and they can now be found across five continents. And could you just note this lovely young, uh, fresh-faced lady with no veil on in her postulant's dress? You're going to meet her again. So Nana and Eagle Place houses the Presentation Sisters Congregational Archive, a vast collection of documents spanning 300 years. The archives contain account books and they contain annals, a kind of a narrative of the convent, um, rule books and school rule books, and many other kind of administrative documents. And they give the details of the kind of stuff of life, but what they don't give is that kind of history of what it was like, the lived experience of what it was like to be a nun and live in a convent and teach poor children. Oh. So the rule of poverty means that we do not hold a vast and rich collection. Religious sisters don't um, keep personal items and even items associated with convent life tend to be heavily worn, um, like this prayer timer you see here. Um, <clears throat> and often things are non-existent because they've been used until they've worn out. Um, and it's really important that we gather what's left of those kind of convent remains and also the memories of the sisters who lived that convent life. So an example of that, um, of, of these kind of issues of kind of I forgot, intangible heritage, the sisters' lived experience, and the loss of collections um, was exemplified this summer when we wanted to um, hold an exhibition about 250 years of convent life. So we said, Sister Rosari, archivist, get out the habits and we'll have a look and see what we have. And we suddenly realised that we didn't have a full habit. We didn't have all of the veil pieces. We had one gamp, which is that white thing, one bandeau and none of the veils. So we had to troop down to the convent and ask Sister Mary uh, on the left and Sister Patricia, who's that young-faced postulant you saw a minute ago on the right, how everything went together. And they sat there for ages going, how did you get it on? How did you? Wait, there were definitely flaps here that held the white thing on. And it was just, it felt like experimental archaeology. And then they revealed to us that the whole veil was pinned together. And that actually, instead of taking it on and off every day, they used to just take it off like a motorbike helmet and hang it on a broomstick. So um, you can see how we're actually in a race against time to capture all of those aspects of convent life that are held with these now very elderly but very charming women. We couldn't have made those habits without them. And, you know, the sisters are fascinating because when they um, commissioned the museum, they actually didn't want to put habits into the museum. They didn't really want to talk about themselves. Nuns don't really talk about themselves. They said, we want to tell the story of Nano. She's our foundress. She's our ethos. And we want to tell the story of our work, our work in Cork and our work around the world. Um, but you, you will know that people like to hear personal stories. So people do enjoy the story of Nan and Eagle. I've done the tour so many times and there's all these bits where you can feel people just leaning in. You know, they're like, what? She didn't tell her family. She actually founded all these secret schools and they were really cross with her. And so, you know, she's a great figure. And I actually remember doing the tour once for a young woman and she said, how old was Nan and Eagle when she, um, when she founded her first school? And I said, well, I think she was about 30. And the woman said, well, I've still got time. And I thought, oh my God, this is actually working. <laughs> How amazing. Um, but yeah, we do have people who want to hear about life in the convent and joining the convent. And <clears throat> tucked away in the sacristy of our museum is this video. And it shows a very young-faced Grace Redmond joining the Presentation Sisters in Wexford in 1966. Um, it's just such an intimate portrait of this experience of her going into the convent. And they had by that time accepted enclosure, so she wasn't gonna come out again. And even in the narrative of the video, you hear her mother's, crack, her mother's voice crack when she says, today's a very special day for us because Gracie's going in to be a nun in the presentation convent. <laughs> and you can hear the emotion in her voice. Grace herself, who is on our board and who I've watched the video with said, I was excited, you know, I didn't think anybody was going to be sad because I was doing what I wanted to do. And if it didn't go well, sure, I could only leave. But she said uh, when we were watching the video that she'd never seen her dad cry before. And there's a part in the video where her dad does break down into tears. And, you know, one of the things that happens, everybody who goes around the museum basically storms out and says, what happened to Grace Redmond? And of course, we can tell them, well, she's on our board. <laughs> 
Right, Shane, you're on. Great, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Um, well, if you cut to 2006, uh, it was a very changed world. Uh, there was once three schools, and I think possibly around 1900, maybe a thousand students. It was a very, very busy place, and the convent had up to 30 sisters at one stage. And that had all changed. The the schools had flown out to the suburb, you know, the inner city of which Cork is, uh, of which the uh, uh, Pres it was originally called, was in decline, uh, and the convent was now down to three essentially little old ladies rambling around a very, um, a very significant holding in the city. This is where it is in Cork. So that's Cork City. It's on an island, a uh, medium-sized city. And we're in the South Parish to the south there, about three and a half acres on that side. So a significant holding, a walled convent. So it wouldn't have been possible for outsiders to get inside. So actually, many of the locals wouldn't have known uh, what was behind those uh, closed walls. Um, here is a... Another picture before the redevelopment. Uh, I mean, it is a village in the city. It is an enclave. It is a world uh, in and of itself. And, and now when people come in, the serenity of this place within the city is, uh, is really rather astounding. Uh, the site uh, is an accumulation of architecture. Georgian from 1771, where Nano built a, a convent for the Ursuline city, uh, sisters from... Um, from uh, from France to the Tranquil Graveyard. Actually, we've got two graveyards on site. A series of 18, very lovely 18th century uh, buildings that were built in sequence. 19th century Goldie, uh, Goldie Chapel, an early 20th century school. But as I said, this was in a state of dereliction. This was in a state of ruin. It looked very sad and sorry. The sisters began to dream big. Um, and there was a process of getting to the start of Nano Nago Place and the start of what we are as a charity and a business. Uh, and the sisters were very experimental. They're very hands-on, they're in entrepreneurial. This is a project called We Made This, uh, which went out and looked at what the need was locally and asked people locally, what do you need? And brought them together. And it was a sort of co-creation of uh, community regeneration. This we made, uh, we made This project then turned into the Lantern Project, which is one of our, uh, one of our core community projects. Um, the, the lady on the left is one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. This is Sister, uh, uh, Sister Jo McCarthy, who's essentially an anarchist as far as I can, I can make out. Uh, she doesn't abide by any of the rules of the religious, uh, the religious order. She does her own thing, which actually is the spirit of Nano Nagel uh, in the 21st century. So Sister Jo established the Cork Migrant Center. Uh, she spent an awful long time in, in South America and I think in the Philippines. And the Cork Migrant Center is raised on death really is to reach out and welcome those new arrivals to Ireland. Started with the Filipino community, uh, the Polish community. More recently, uh, we have something in Ireland called the Direct Provision Service, where, whereby refugees are housed in really terrible, dispiriting and depressing circumstances, essentially boxed into, into open prisons. And uh, we do a huge amount of work. Our sister Joe and our colleagues, Dr. Naomi Machetti, does that. And more recently, as was noted earlier, the Ukrainian community uh, is arriving on our doorstep. And sister Joe and uh, Dr. Naomi Machetti are reaching out to that community and making them feel welcome. Um, so cut forward, significant investment, beautiful regeneration. Um, so some of the older pictures, changing to, before and after. This is the convent, now repurposes community rooms. And this is a nice picture here. On, on the right hand side is our men's group, one of our three core groups. Uh, and this is the old uh, parlor and now the men's group a men's shed uh, might be a, an expression known to people in Ireland and England. Some very, very vulnerable, often lonely, isolated men uh, with social problems, uh, addiction problems, and bring those men together. Probably our most challenging group, actually. Uh, and that's actually bringing you know, those men back into the core of what we're doing. Um, I'll just let this play and then hand over to Danielle. It's playing. <laughs> This gives you some idea of the scale of the site. Yeah, and just to say, um, yeah, I was just checking with Susanna, who, who looks after our uh, rooms and events, and the English classes, the free English classes for Ukrainian people start in a few hours. So uh, the work continues. So Nano Nagel Place is a, a calm and a tranquil space, um, and in its regenerated state, it's become a real sanctuary. Um, for museum visitors and for the community education participants, um, Cog Migrant Centre, the Lantern and the Men's Group moved back on into this regenerated site in uh, 2018 um, 
and we all became neighbours because the, the museum had opened um, halfway through 2017. Um, Shane has already mentioned this direct provision and at the moment the main focus of Cork Migrant Centre is working with those people and really making Nanonego Place a sanctuary. So essentially what direct provision is, is housing families in hotels and they have one hotel room each. So the whole family live in one room. They have no cooking facilities and they have to eat meals at set meal times. So you can imagine how absolutely disruptive that is to family life. And women are often, they've got young children, they're trapped in these direct provision centres. And so Naomi and her team really work to bring those women into Nanonego Place to look after the babies because they're living in weird, like horrible hotel environments. There's no early years um, um, kind of provision for the little, the little children. So they get looked after by students from University College Cork's early years department. And the women do capacity building um, activities. Naomi calls this healing through crafts. And she says that Nano Nagel Place or Cork Migrant Centre for these women is a psychosocial well-being centre. She's looking out for what their needs are and she's trying to help them and empower them to kind of settle in to Irish society. And actually, um, these women have recently formed a cooperative which just won a Cork Business Award. Oh, sorry. Uh, these, here they are. So this is them doing printmaking. Sometimes the children join in the activities as well. Um, so they've actually just won, I think it was the Cork Business Awards kind of innovative business of the year. So they're so proud. So they're off now and making their own money, having kind of been empowered through the service. Um, we do look after toddlers too, but another really important group is the teenagers. Because if you can imagine that you're living in a hotel room with your mum and dad, how do you even do your homework? How do you kind of, often these direct provision centres are in the middle of nowhere. So they have to use kind of a bus transport service a few times a week to get to different places. So at Nano Nagel Place, they come, there's a homework club, and um, they get to do um, loads of different creative activities. And hip hop is very important to them. So the CMC Youth Initiative Ubuntu Hip Hop Group are amazing. And you're gonna see um, a picture later of when they actually managed to get our prime minister to do a TikTok dance. They're absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Um, oh, have I gone backwards? I have. So just to say, you know, um, you know, when you read lots of museum theory and they talk about museums and how everyone works in a silo and nobody works with each other. And I have to admit to you that when CMC and the Lantern came and came back to Nanonego Place, they had their vision. We had to run the museum and we didn't work together very much. And actually, interestingly, they didn't work together very much. They had team meetings together, but the lantern came Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the, the migrants came kind of Thursday and Friday. So everybody missed each other. We were like ships that passed in the night. Um, and we decided we had to do something about that. So if we're a real museum, the collections are relevant to our outreach. I wish that I had the beautiful video that broke this whole PowerPoint <laughs> to show you. I've, sh I've working on a project called Diversity Academy, which is completely stolen from Tanya Bagheera's School of Inclusion, and I completely admit that a good idea doesn't care who had it. I love that phrase. Um, and essentially, this brought the migrants and the Lantern together, uh, participants to work on a, a combined craft project based on our collections. So I said to you that Nano Nagel taught people how to work and she taught girls how to sew. And in the collection, we have these incredible embroidery samplers that girls would have made. And it's like a CV in stitches, essentially. And it was the thing that you could take out to get you a job. So look at all these sewing stitches that I can do. So the, the, they looked at those, our, our um, archivists talked them through the history of the samplers, and they were inspired by that to go make their own project. And they all made a piece of embroidery around the theme of home. This was a beautiful project with the artist Anne Metrelink in the centre. She cried after every session. <laughs> it was really moving. Um, and they've demanded a trip to the seaside and for the next project to start very soon. So I consider that to be a success. <laughs> um, so COVID came and hit us all like a freight train. And as Shane's already said, some incredibly vulnerable people engage with the services at Nano Nagel Place. So the Lantern, who look after um, isolated older people, were sending 2,000 texts a week to all of their participants. And Karina was basically channeling herself, Karina, the director of the Lantern, was channeling herself on Facebook, just sending hopeful and positive messages. And that seemed to really get people through. Um, uh, Cork Migrant Centre went one step further 
Nano Nagel would have been so proud of them, they totally broke the lockdown. They um, decided that anybody living in direct provision was just not safe because they all live crammed in together. How can you socially distance in a hotel when you all sleep in one bedroom and share a hotel with so many families? So uh, there were some of the women in direct provision were seriously good seamstresses. They started sewing face masks before face masks became mandatory. And by breaking lockdown rules, beg, borrow, by begging and borrowing um, sewing machines, they managed to deliver three reusable face masks to everybody in direct provision in County Cork. And I can't remember how many people that is. Whoops, I keep forgetting to do the slides. Back, it go back, it'll go back. There they are, there they are sewing in the garden. So um, it was a ser serious piece of work, but it was so impressive. Um, another group who were particularly vulnerable were the men's group. Um, they started going out for walks in the park together. Again, lots of text messages going around. And as soon as it was possible to get them back in to the site, um, they came back in. And not everybody made it through the lockdown from that group, which was really tragic. But it shows you just how vulnerable they really are. <clears throat> now, as you will remember, during the lockdown, um, George Floyd was killed. And that had a huge impact on the CMC Youth Initiative. And they decided to call a meeting with the Lord Mayor of Cork City and um, people from the Department of Education to highlight instances of when they'd experienced racism in Ireland. And they wanted to um, also make a creative output to, to kind of express their pain and how they were feeling. So Shane gave them the front windows of Nanonagle Place. Uh, we had an artist whose name I can't remember. Kate O'Shea. Kate O'Shea, who came and worked with them. And they made this amazing artwork that ran right across the windows. And again, you kind of say, well, does this relate to the collection? Well, over on the right-hand side, you can just see deeds, not words. That's Nano Nagel's family motto. So they were very proud of this artwork. And obviously, they had to have a serious dance uh, to, uh, to celebrate its, um, its launch. So we are a community embedded museum but at the heart of our site, we have a religious community. So it's a sacred space and a place where religious sisters still live and where Nano Nagel, who is on her way to beatification, is buried. Um, as a mainly secular staff, uh, we have a delicate job to do in making the space of and with the community while also being respectful of the sisters and their ethos and spirituality. Uh, we want to be really approachable and to give all suggestions due consideration and to say yes to as many of them as possible. So it's just that balancing act, you know, because it is a sacred space. So uh, a man got in contact recently. He wanted to run a play uh, in, in the chapel. And I read the content of the play and then said, I don't think this works for an ex-convent. And he said, oh, no, you're absolutely right. You know, it still is a, a convent. Um, so we've done things like had Chinese New Year, and as museum professionals, this could freak you out. It was a thousand live candles. They couldn't be electronic, and they couldn't be blown out. So we had to wait until they went out before we could go home. And we left our youngest mem me member of the facilities team who promised us he hadn't blown them out, but I'm not sure. It was a very <laughs> long evening. We had a Chinese dragon. It was just a great event. I know those kind of events where it's just like, this is what it's all about. Um, we are the, the home of East Cork Early Music Festival. Oh, whoops, I keep forgetting to do the slide. Sorry, everyone. And um, they're a very lively bunch. We have great kind of concerts with them. The acoustic in our chapel is really beautiful, but they also run our children's outreach for us. And another of the videos was showing uh, children dressed up in 18th century costumes doing some 18th century dancing. Uh, this was a good one. We hosted the Guinness, uh, Guinness Cork Jazz Festival. This was edgy because we do have a coffin on our site that is where Nana was buried and you can see it. And this performance did also include a coffin because it was a New Eileen style jazz funeral called Requiem for Truth. And I know that some sisters were a bit upset, but one of them volunteered to do the eulogy so they weren't all upset. <laughs> and that culminated in a procession uh, through the site. Uh, whoops which was absolutely amazing. The coffin came down the steps and we had another little um, jazz session on the front plaza. And you know, it, it is a tricky thing and, and I guess all of you guys will know it. If you're a community museum, you kind of feel like you have to say yes to the community. But it's a balancing act because, as I was saying to our team earlier, what do you do when the choir who can't sing wants to come and sing? Um, 
you have, you know, they said, we love you. We love here. This is where we want to sing. And you say, great. <laughs> and then I guess it's just really clever programming to work out where community events sit uh, so that we don't compromise kind of m more kind of better performances. I'm going to thank it amongst friends um, by, you know, people like East Gawker Music Festival. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Shane. I'm going to try. <laughs> Uh, Danielle, thank you very much. Um, my, my instruction to Danielle is to say no to everybody, and she does absolutely the opposite and says yes to everybody. Uh, but it is, it is the joy of Nano Lego Place. It means we all work seven days a week, um, and it is a community hub. As part of that, we, we aim to be, as I said, we're an enclave. We sort of joke maybe we're like an Italian hilltop village in the city. Uh, the site is, as I said, spread over three and a half acres, and it's a very hilly site. The sort of the, the, the elevations probably move about five floors from one side to the other, so you get these marvellous views uh, across the city. Um, so, let me just go to the next one. Um, so Cork is a UNESCO uh, city of learning. It's a World Heritage uh, organization Healthy City. It's a city of sanctuary. Uh, it has recently been announced as one of the European Commission's 100 climate neutral cities. And we aim to sort of exemplify all those values, you know, to be all things good in Cork in one uh, significant uh, place. Um, and I'll, I'll, finish on, I'll finish on this lovely image. Um, for those that don't know, uh, the gentleman uh, in the middle is our Taoiseach, our Premier, our Prime Minister, and this was, uh, this photograph was taken on Saturday Gone, uh, when the Taoiseach very kindly came and visited us in recognition of the uh, Council of Europe Museum Prize Award. Um, and we had all the different uh, parts of Nano Lego Place there, including the young people from uh, the Cork Migrant Centre. And there is a TikTok video, uh, which their PR were extraordinarily nervous about, but we managed to get we managed to get this. Uh, we managed to get this image here. Ireland is uh, a young country. It's a young republic. We're 100 years old, and actually, I think the distance travelled from 1922 to 2022 is, I would hope, exemplified by this image here. You know, the, the future is migration. The future is those things that I've talked about, and uh, you know, our recognition by the Council of Europe in terms of those democratic values, in terms of those bridging communities, in terms of you know, uh, a, a secular staff actually paying due homage to that continuity of community, to that living heritage. Uh, that's what we want to exemplify. We don't always get it right, but I think we're entrepreneurial, uh, we're creative, or certainly my colleagues are, in a way that Nano was, and we bring that 18th century story alive and into the 21st century. So it's, look, it's a huge honor on behalf of myself, my colleague uh, Danielle, my other colleague Sorsha and Susanna here, the board and the sisters. It's an enormous honor to receive the award and to stand before you here today. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to the conference. See, that's what a museum looks like that already know they won an award. <laughs> um, m my comment last week was, I think it would be really interesting to follow you now with this new self-confidence and sort of international recognition. Because I remember one of the things you said, Danielle, was this working in these separate units and separate functions and separate kind of activities where, of course, when you listen from the outside, what's really wonderful is the unity of all this. And for me, that unity is actually what constitutes the museum. The museum is not there and then all these. So I think that whole is, is what we will be seeing really expand over the years. We do have time for a question or two because we've been very disciplined. Um, does anyone have a comment or a question out there? Yes, I see someone here. Agnes, do you have a mic or do I run with a mic? Can I just be very loud? No, I think loud. Is it working? Oh. Yeah. Um, that was very moving and impressive, thank you. I was just curious, the people who are coming to visit a museum, what are they expecting when they go in and how do they respond when they leave? Maybe I'll, I'll start off. Is it, it is a challenge to, 
orientate people when they come in in that we're a values-based museum whereby it's as important to exemplify those values uh, that are uh, that, that are told in the in the museum um, and I think you know we're, we're on TripAdvisor we're all on TripAdvisor these days and there's three things that come out of the come out of the you know the the, the, the journey from visitors. One is that it's a beautiful place and it is stunningly beautiful, but that's not unique. Um, that uh, they get a really warm welcome. We've got some marvelous staff and it's a story that resonates. And I think Danielle mentioned earlier, the, the Nagel family motto is deeds, not words. And actually we literally ask you at the end of the tour, what are you going to do in your very, very small way? And I think that does resonate. You know, people, you, you can go in as a religious history, educational history, Cork history, but actually it's a personal story of transformation. So that's what we want to do. We're, 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 there, to, we're there to ask that question of people. Uh, that's when we're successful. We're not always successful. And to, to get that narrative together it is a challenge yeah and i'm glad you asked that question because i was just standing there going i forgot to say something <laughs> so i can i can answer your question with it and you know um when we first started um all of the community education really happened in one building and the museum was in another building and it was actually covid that broke that like you know covid has been so horrible it's actually really helped us as an organization to just calm down slow down go you know um what are we doing? And everybody had to come outside. So suddenly, you know, music for well-being was in the secret courtyard in the museum. And the crochet ladies, uh, they were in the top courtyard and they just had hot water bottles during the winter when it was cold and they just kept crocheting outside. And so suddenly people were encountering what we would have called the other side of the house, but thank goodness it isn't anymore. People are actually saying, wait a minute, what's happening here? This is actually history that's being enacted again in, in the present and we actually made some signage as well and they just tried to kind of like infographics to kind of quantify how many people engage with all the services and you know we didn't want to turn it into signed soup but it has worked because people keep offering us funding which has been wonderful Thank you and congratulations for the prize. And um, I think that you're not confident with this. So what are your challenges for the future? It's a very good question. Um, I'm gonna, well, there is a funding challenge which I can let Shane talk through because we are an independent museum. We're not a state funded museum uh, and uh, we must generate our own revenue. And everybody knows that museums are wonderful but they are luxury items. So there has to be a very strong entrepreneurial strand to our business to make, to be able to pay for all of these really great works that are happening. Shane, I'll let you pick that up. I, I think uh, I think one thing, uh, Danielle's from a, a heritage background. I'm, I'm from a sort of an urban design background. Um, Dr. Naomi Machetti is from, uh, she's a psychologist. So, th so there's, a, there's a lot of different viewpoints and I think that's been something that's really been important to us. One thing that really became apparent that wasn't there on day one in 2017 is the museum was there and the community services were over there. We've realized that the whole site is the museum, the whole site is the community service, and it's to take, uh, it's to take the museum out into the whole, the whole site, not just keep it in that very beautiful deconsecrated uh, chapel. The other thing that's a real challenge is um, three sisters live on site and we're next door to the convent. This is a living community. This is a, a continuative community. I think it's the longest inhabited convent in Ireland. But the sisters are elderly. This is a legacy project. And although they are uh, thriving to a large extent in the developing world in places like Pakistan and Zambia and so on, the, they haven't taken any new sisters in, in some 20 odd years. So they're getting older and older. Uh, one of the projects that Danielle brilliantly did was put a podcast together and it's to record those stories. We have sisters on site doing tours. Um, and this is a slice in time, a bit like that video you saw earlier. This is a slice in time that is, is disappearing. 
you know, re- religion in Ireland, the Catholic Church in Ireland has been through 20 years, 50 years of rightful condemnation for some of the practices that they've had. There's no getting away from that. And we're very comfortable, certainly on our side, of broaching that conversation into the future. But also it's a community that's disappearing. And it's a community that's done amazing things in Ireland in terms of, you know, in terms of um, women's health, in terms of women's education. Uh, and, and Nano is a, is a proto-feminist. And, and that's a message that we want to get out. There are dark stories in there in, in Ireland's past the sisters themselves are primarily concerned with education so some of the practices in terms of what we call industrial schools or hospitals didn't happen but that's our good fortune and and good luck we are we recognize that we're part of a wider narrative that is challenging and we've got to be open about that but we've also got to remind people that there's some gold in there and that we shouldn't uh, and it has made us who we are uh, and that we're there to tell that story so i think you to capture that story before the sisters are are maybe no longer there um is a challenge going forward. Yeah, just nuns are deeply unpopular in Ireland at the moment. There's a huge association, especially with mother and baby homes. Um, But we can't let that negativity of now stop us from recording their history because when they're gone, they're gone. And so we've just, we've been working really hard. So we have a lovely man who helps with our podcast and he's driving out to Yall next week to meet Sister Stan and she's 101. So how much history, you know, is going to come out over the course of, of that interview? So yeah, so so kind of capturing the now is and, a challenge. And I think that, you know, when I sat down to the interview and I had uh, the board and the sisters in front of me and I said, you know, look, I need to get this straight, guys. You know, I'm not a person of, of faith. And the re- response from the congregation leader, look, if you're passionate about education and social justice and you can do, uh, do reference to our history, we're, we're for you. And actually, it's been an amazing experience for me. You know, I lived in London for 20 years and come into Ireland naively in, t- in terms of this job. And to get to know a community, and it is a community, and a living community, uh, and realising actually that what we're here to do is although we may be a secular, largely a secular board and a secular team, is actually play due homage to that and record that story because it is important. And actually on a personal level, it's been, it's a, been a real joy and, a, and, a, and an eye-opener. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you again, and I think we're all congratulating you, and we're ready to start the first panel of our museum candidates, uh, Atla, and the people who are in the program for now. Atla, are you coming there? Yeah. We got that one wrong. (laughs) We actually start with Amina. (laughs) So we have this app and we have the program and we're really proud of these new facilities. It's just a question of checking them before you stand here and say the wrong thing. So I'm handing over to Amina and you will say why you're here, Amina. (laughs) Thank you, Yeta, and uh, good morning and welcome once again, everybody. Um, First of all, I wanted to say congratulations once again to our colleagues at Nano Nagla it was a very uh, inspiring presentation. Of course, I knew through our discussions as, as a jury a lot about your work, but it was really amazing to, to hear more. And also, I would like to just uh, briefly reflect on what I've seen is that your museum really represents, uh, uh, it well illustrates actually, the, the potential of museums and uh, and their power in helping societies heal and advance as, as they heal with with as a community and, and uh, it's really fantastic what you do. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as you may have already heard, I have stepped in on a very short notice in place of our dear colleague Marilyn Molieu, who um, just uh, before her trip to Tartu was involved in an accident and uh, stepping in in Marilyn's place this morning, but also more generally uh, as chair of the EMIA jury for the upcoming season, uh, is a great honor, but also a great challenge as Marlene has set the bar really high in the previous years. 
um, in the EMF EMEA records, this past year will be remembered as a year of resistance to many obstacles and as a year of challenge-based flexible replanning of operations, both on the part of the very vibrant European Museum community, but of course also on the side of EMEA and EMF uh, team. So despite the fact that we had uh, severe lockdowns imposed in, in spring of 2021, the European Museum Forum decided to carry on with business as usual, if I may say it that way, and decided to go on with the EMEA 22 competition. So against all the odds, the competition did go uh, the usual way. And it resulted even in a very high total number of candidates. I had some slides. I am not sure if they are here. Can, so can somebody hear me? And <laughs> no? Okay. So by the end of May, 2021, there were 39 museum candidates from 19 Council of Europe member states, and those together with 21 museums differed from the 2021 competition due to COVID-related restrictions, rounded to a total number of 60 candidate museums for EMEA 22. Uh, and these uh, candidates were coming from 27 Council of Europe member states. S the, the number included the Russian Federation before its recent expulsion from the Council of Europe due to its military invasion of Ukraine. What this number speaks about is the continued relevance of EMEA awards for European museums. And during summer and autumn of 2021, EMEA judges managed to visit all 60 candidates, and more than a dozen, have, dozen of, of candidates have been visited twice. So the EMEA jury that covered all this extensive work was composed of 13 members, and three of, of these uh, jurors were guest past judges called on by the EMF board to support the jury and increase its capacity. So as everyone here, I'm sure, is interested in learning more about the EMEA judging procedure, I have prepared a short overview of the four distinct stages <laughs> of how we work, how the selection process works, but uh, for some reason, yeah, I cannot show them. So I will try to briefly summarize how, how we work. So first, we have the eligibility check as a first stage, where all submitted applications are distributed electronically to all uh, members of the jury. And we check if uh, applications, or rather the, the museum applicant, meets the eligibility criteria. And once we have established this, then there is the second stage, which is actually the, the visits, the first round of visits to candidate museums. After uh, the first round of visits, so, so the judges prepare very detailed reports on every visit and then uh, we make recommendations on which uh, awards, would, which museum we would nominate for which awards. And based on this, so the museums that are nominated for the European Museum of the Year Award and the Council of Europe Museum Prize are visited second time in a subsequent stage. And um, this is, so this second visit is not uh, announced. Judges visit museums uh, anonymously and they don't meet the staff. It's just like a regular visit of, of anyone from the general audience. And then the, the fourth and final stage in the, in the selection procedure is uh, the annual meeting of judges that takes place over three days where all the nominations are discussed and where we actually make the final decision on the winners. Uh, Yetta has already 
We mentioned briefly that uh, this, as of this year, we have introduced several novelties, and uh, one of those that we are really proud of, and that I invite you to check out on the EMF website, is the switch from paper to web-based brochure. It's it's really interactive and and comprehensive place where you can find information on all candidate museums and as of uh, this Saturday also it will be extended to to include uh, information on winners. Um, also uh, during the the pandemic which was not strictly related to EMEA 22 but it was introduced before all mm, nominated museums were invited to produce short videos about their identity and their work and by now and to send them of course to to us and by now we have more than 120 videos posted online for that are referring to EMIA nominees for to for the past 3 years 20 2020 uh, 20 2020 22 competitions and uh, these videos again, represent invaluable resource for museum professionals, for students, for general audience, whoever is interested in learning more about uh, some of the best museums in Europe and their work. And we thank all contributing museums for their efforts to produce these inspiring videos. So this 45th EMIA season nominees list it reflects the great diversity of museum excellence in Europe. So the themes of the panels you will see in the program of the conference illustrate this diversity and it is clustered. We tried, we work really hard to cluster this in panels, in thematic panels that respond to institutional and conceptual identities of nominated museums. And I hope that uh, these two days ahead of us will be extremely productive, but also equally enjoyable, and it, that they will uh, that we will manage to create even larger and stronger EMEA community during these days. Uh, finally, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all the fellow judges for the very hard work in the past year for all the dedication and diligence in deciding on this year's winners. Uh, the EMEA 2022 competition has also been supported greatly by the European Museum Forum Administrator, Pedro Branco, who's based in Portimao Museum in, in Portugal. And we are all very grateful to Pedro for his uh, help and hospitality during um, judges' annual meetings in, in Portimao. Uh, we would also like to express our sincere thanks to national correspondents, whose role was even more important in the past uh, years because of the pandemic. It was very challenging and difficult to travel to different locations, and we often uh, were uh, receiving uh, a lot of logistics, logistical support from national correspondents. And uh, last but not least, um, I would like to express gratitude to board of the European Museum Forum that provides policies and directions which sustain the vision of the European Museum Forum. And it has shown um, tireless uh, and constant support to the judges and the judging process. I would like to, to thank them on, on my own behalf, but also on behalf of the jury. And a uh, especially warm round of applause to the chair of the EMF, Yeta Sandal, and for her impeccable leadership. Can we please? Thank you. Uh, at the end of this year conference, some of the members of the 2022 jury panel are leaving the jury, either because they have completed their mandates or for some other personal reasons. But EMEA jury, however, has been already reshaped in order to start the next 2023 season. <clears throat> so for this <clears throat> year, we are welcoming four new judges with whom we are ready to face the challenges of the upcoming season. Thank you all.
for your attention and enjoy the conference. Hello, everybody. Now we start. Um, my name is uh, Atle Faye, uh, and I will be the moderator of the two first sections here. Um, and who am I? Um, the member of the judging panel uh, comes from different kind of museums uh, with different kind of backgrounds. Uh, my background, some years ago, I worked in uh, the National Museum in Norway, in Oslo. Uh, now, uh, my prof profession is to be Head of Communication uh, at the Oslo National Academy of the Arts. Uh, I'm one of the three guys that um, came back to the judging panel this year. Actually, I left the judging panel eight years ago when uh, this similar assembly was in uh, Tallinn. Uh, but I've been uh, joining the jury um, also last year and this year and have the opportunity to visit uh, a lot of good museums. Some of you will know me from before. Uh, but I've also been one of these mysterious Sherlock Holmes uh, going around uh, as an anonymous uh, judge. Both is very interesting. Um, all work in the judge is voluntary work. Um, so uh, we use quite a lot of time. Uh, we write individual reports. Um, and uh, then we had the jury meeting, uh, trying to find the museums that will, we will be awarded. And during this conference, you'll see that it can be very hard, because there are so many good candidates, 60 this year. Uh, so we had com to compare and contrast small museums, big museums, voluntary work, everything. Well, it's a, it's a battle. Uh, in the jury, uh, but you also have to compare and contrast uh, to fight for your candidate, but also listen to what your, uh, the other members of the jury are saying, uh, if there are better uh, candidates. Uh, but the quality is very, very high, uh, and I'm sure you will be aware of that during these sessions. Uh, and um, no, we will have them in groups. At, and maybe some of you are thinking, why am I in that group and not the other group? Well, sometimes museums uh, can be uh, placed in different groups, but we ended up with this. And in the first group, we have three museums. Uh, there are some small changes in the program, so if you have downloaded the version uh, with the, the program on your mobile phone, you can follow it, and I also think this is updated. Um, the first group um, is for museums, on collaborations with cities and local communities. Um, and I would like to check first if everything is okay, because we have two uh, museums online presentation. Uh, Holstebro Museum in Denmark, are you here? Yeah. Uh, it's, would you like to join us here at the stage? Um, it's... Uh, for all the um, people here, it's also a screen in front of here. So when you're sitting here, you, you don't have to move like this. You can follow the whole thing here. Uh, and, Viola, here I can see two, three persons here. Uh, is it possible to... Uh, is, uh, where is um, the House of Museums in Switzerland? It's there. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> and Aberdeen Art Gallery. Hello. Hello. Please, come here. Uh, most of the museums uh, will have a presentation by using a PowerPoint. Some museum has asked to show a video. Uh, and if you haven't noticed yet, it's a very good presentation on the website with vi video from a lot of the museums. Yes, uh, and you are the first museum. You have a PowerPoint, I guess? Yeah. Would you like to stand there or would you like to, to be here? But you can also be sitting there and using this one if, you, if it feels more comfortable to sit here. You would like to be here. Yeah. Uh, you push it this in, uh, forward. 
and I backwards. I think your presentation is uh, in eight seconds every, they told me. Yeah. So maybe it runs. It runs yes. Yeah. Eight minutes is not much. Seconds. <laughs> so eight seconds. Yes. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Mette Klingenberg, and uh, this is my colleague, Sarah Abeltrup, and we are here to present the uh, Holstebro Museum. Uh, Holstebro Museum is a regional museum for cultural history situated in the city of Holstebro in Western Jutland in the country of Denmark. Uh, we reopened after a large rebuilding in October 2019. Our exhibition galleries are spread across almost 400 square meters. We share entrance with the local art museum, thereby offering our visitors a trip to two museums uh, and also uh, a visit to our restaurant and our gift shop. We aim to advise families in Western Jutland to better understand and connect with their local region. So we um, invite them to explore our exhibitions and we refer all our stories uh, to the places in the local landscape uh, where the stories actually came from, thereby making our visitors aware of the landscape and the history it possesses. Uh, we present history uh, of a remote part of Denmark. Uh, we place the local history in a national and an international context, making our visitors aware that our local area is not a closed one. On the contrary, we are situated in an area and telling the history of an area uh, where we have always been se uh, seeking and giving inspiration to others. We want to offer a vibrant house that welcomes a number of different groups, being a museum for both the tourist and the local community, telling stories that make people proud of the area they live in. And now uh, Sarah will tell you a little bit more about how we seek to collaborate with local communities. Yes, thank you. Uh, when we reopened our new museum, it was very important to us that we would make uh, some new uh, events where we invited the local community in, both where we made some joint uh, events with them or where they just could use our space as a, a place where they could uh, reach out to the rest of the community. So we have had uh, different kinds of events. Uh, obviously, we made a collaboration uh, where we told the story of how everyone in this community experienced uh, the COVID lockdown. And it was a very... Uh, giving a opportunity to hear their story and they had to bring an item that told their story and then they could visit it later on uh, in a, a collaboration with the rest of the community. And we also had the, recently a election uh, where we had to elect a new mayor in the city. So we opened our space up to a place where you could uh, have a democratic and uh, local debate uh, of how your political views were, uh, but also from a point of historical view and what kind of identity does this community have and what does uh, our history have uh, inflected in us today and maybe further on. And uh, lastly, we have a new upcoming uh, special uh, uh, exhibition about the wolf returning to Denmark. And that's a very touching uh, uh, subject in our part of Denmark because it's located, uh, it's basically located right where our community is. So there's a lot of difficult uh, and different feeling about this wolf because some welcomes it and uh, some does not. And there's two very opposite and strong opinions uh, about this wolf. So we are very looking forward to this exhibition and how it may be uh, open up our museum to new guests, some who would maybe not uh, visit us before, but now because we have a, a exhibition with a subject they're interested in, it will make them want to visit us and maybe even want to revisit us again because they experience that we actually tell a lot about themselves uh, because we know their history and therefore maybe also why they identify as they do. Yeah, and we have a very good uh, collaboration with our uh, local community. We had a lot of volunteers uh, who fight for our place and who helps us because money is sometimes tight. So we, we need all the, the free help we can. 
And they are also a very good advocate for our place because they love it as much as we do who works there. So they uh, they uh, tell about us to their own family and down in the shops. So it's a uh, it's something you can live without. A uh, very good and close connection to your local community. Yeah. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sarah Mette, what is your role in the museum? Uh, your profession? Uh, you? I'm actually... Uh, Do you have to use yeah. the micro microphone? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually an archaeologist, uh, uh, but um, when we uh, made the rebuilding, um, I was one of uh, 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 I was uh, in the group uh, who made the, the new exhibition, um, uh, and I especially made the, the, the part with the Vikings and the Middle Ages. And I is it on? Is it on? It is on. I studied history, so I'm a historian. Thank you. Just sit down. Uh, each museum I've given five minutes, and um, you have a perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you. Then the plan is to go to the House of Museums in Switzerland. Are you still with us? Yes, we are. We're sharing <laughs> our presentation right now. Can you see it already? Yes. I can see, not the presentation, I can see your uh, beautiful faces. <laughs> uh, it should, it should No, work. I can see it. Uh, it's there. Okay. 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 Great. Perfect. So we'll start then. <laughs> well, hello everybody. Um, first of all, we would like to thank you very much for the nomination and we are very happy to be able to participate in the annual EMEA conference today and to present our diverse museum. Symbolic for this diversity, we decided to present our muse museum together. My colleague, Yvonne Areco, from the Historical Museum of Olten, supports me today. My name is Karin Zurbühler. I'm the director of the Archaeological Museum of the Canton of Solothurn, and together, we are part of the team of the House of Museums in Olten, in Switzerland. Let's just start with who we are. The House of Museums is a good cultural institution that unites three museums under its roof. These are the Olten Museum of Nature, the Historical Museum of Olten, and the Archaeological Museum of the Canton of Solothurn. While the Historical Museum and the Museum of Nature are financed by the municipality of Olten, the Archaeological Museum is under the supervision of the canton of Solothurn. The House of Museums was born out of a crisis when Olten found itself in financial difficulty because of tax deficit in 2014. In order to save money, the closures of one or more museums were discussed. Then came the saving idea. The three museums were moved into a single house. In the long run, this possibility should lead to cost savings and to uh, the creation of collaboration and synergies. In November 2019, the House of Museum opened for its audience. Today, two and a half years later, we can offer our visitors four exhibitions on four floors. One on the archaeology of the canton, one on the history of the city and the region, and one on the nature of the Olten region. The fourth floor offers a temporary exhibition whose themes are as varied as the exhibitions on the other three floors. We also have a cinema where films are shown that stand in relation with our exhibitions. In this way, in this way we combine diversity and locality in our house. We see ourselves as a museum for everyone and offer events and courses for a wide variety of audiences. Children, senior citizens, but also people with special needs, needs and of course, everyone else, um, get their money's worth. 
by organizing a lot of open house events, such as the so-called Family Sunday, and by participating in international and national events, such as the International Museum Day or the Swiss Storytelling Evening, we open our doors as much as possible for all our audiences. We are a low threshold cultural institution and try to offer something for everyone with our rich and varied program, thus providing the local community with as much as possible. That is our primary goal. One of the ways we try to achieve this goal is with new approaches, of course. Um, in the Historical Museum, for example, we have uh, set up a history workshop. We are sitting currently right in this workshop. Um, and their restorers and researchers work uh, right in the exhibition and explain their work to uh, visitors. This gives, gives uh, visitors a glimpse behind the scenes of the museum's work and creates transparency towards the outside world. Another approach we pursue is the concept of the museum outdoors. Uh, we try to organize various activities and offers outside the museum. Uh, this could be special guided tours, um, for example, a visit to a hydroelectric power station as part of an exhibition um, or an excursion into nature with the children of our so-called Beetle Club, as you see on the picture. Then a third approach are our interdisciplinary guided tours. They offer in one hour uh, short tours through all uh, exhibitions. Uh, that gives the visitors an overview of the whole house and provides them with interesting facts. And a fourth approach, which we have taken up mainly because of the special exhibition on the anniversary of the introduction of women's suffrage in 2021, is the Wikipedia workshop. Uh, through this and other means, we try to make our collections accessible uh, to as wide an audi audience as possible. Um, in our opinion, it should not be difficult to benefit from the treasures in our exhibitions and collections uh, and thereby profit from the knowledge and collection our collections can offer to everyone. We thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yvonne and Karin. I think it was uh, on your first uh, presentation, but could you um, could you tell us your role in the museum, um, who you are, yes. what you are doing in the museum? I, I am Karin is the director of the Archaeological Museum of the Canton of Solothurn, and uh, I myself are a research assistant in the Historical Museum of Alton. And your colleague? Uh, <laughs> Karin, Karin is, the, is the director of the Archaeological yes. Museum. Sorry. Yes. The Canton of Solothur, yes. Good. So, yes, she's the head of the Archaeological Museum, exactly. It's nice to hear because um, we are, uh, as judges, we are meeting, uh, first of all, directors in the museum, but we also like to meet uh, uh, the staff, uh, and, and this has come through through the presentations, uh, really good. Thank you very much, we'll come back to you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Nearly feel like the European Song Contest, now we uh, call up Aberdeen. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I was going to share my... Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfectly. Okay, that's fantastic. I will share my screen, hopefully. Um, and we should be able to start. Have we got that on screen? Not no? yet. Hmm. No, it's on screen. Oh, here we go. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So my name is Helen Fothergill. I'm um, head of the Archives, Museums and Gallery in Aberdeen. Um, and Aberdeen's in Scotland, in the UK. Um, I'm actually part of Aberdeen City Council. So we're a local authority museum service. Um, and the original art gallery that's up for um, this um, nominated award, which is fantastic, um, opened in 1886. Um, at the time, we opened as a contemporary art gallery. Now, contemporary in 1886 means we've got quite a lot of old 
art now, um, but those collections were uh, originally collected um, to be contemporary art. So that's a challenge in its own um, right, trying to tell that story. Um, we closed for redevelopment in 2015 and reopened in 2019 in November. And of course, pretty quickly afterwards, closed again due to the um, COVID restrictions. Um, we reopened um, again after COVID and quickly shut down again um, for a further lockdown in Scotland. Um, and um, during all of this process, we were really um, lucky to be nominated for the UK um, Museum of the Year Award, um, which is um, run by the Art Fund. Um, as part of that award, um, and we were lucky enough to be one of the joint winners um, of that award, we were given £40,000 to spend as we wish. Um, because we were in the middle of the lockdown, we had a significant and serious discussion about how best to use this money in light of the fact that we saw creative um, practitioners and artists all around us struggling to make ends meet and to really face the challenges of where their next commission was coming from with all of these major institutions closing down. We were also interested in trying to um, expand our collection to make it a little bit more responsive um, to the, the current um, attitudes and current um, situation within the, the wider community of the city and the northeast of Scotland. So we set up a series of micro commissions and basically gave our money away, um, not completely altruistically, because I did actually add to the collection as part of this programme. Um, so what we, what we looked at um, and what we set up was a, a small scale, a series of small scale, fast paced commissions. We um, made them open to all forms of creative practice. Um, it was because we were Art Fund Museum of the Year um, award winner that we were able to do this. And um, over 2020 and 2021, we awarded four prizes of £3,000 each and eight prizes of £850 each. And on each of these slides, you'll see one of the um, resulting commissions. So there were 12 commissions in total by the end of what we were doing. Um, so the aims of the project really were to increase the visibility of Aberdeen's artists, makers, creative practitioners in our collection. We wanted to bring in new voices and new ways of speaking about the world around us. Um, we wanted to work with artists and makers who represented Aberdeen's mixed and diverse communities. And we wanted to understand what kind of support they need and what was in demand locally. So we were trying to do quite a lot with this very small pot of money. The brief that we sent out to people, to these individual artists that they were allowed to apply for this fund was to respond to an object, artist or theme in Aberdeen's um, permanent collections, um, create a new work that speaks to their own experience of Aberdeen. So the themes were um, as broad as social justice, climate change, identity politics, um, diversity, well-being, migration. Um, and you can see here one of the one of these particular um, commissions responded to what it was like in lockdown. The outcomes were that we've ended up with 12 new artworks entering the collection. We've got documentation of the whole creative process. We've created new friendships, connections and opportunities within the artistic community. We've now got confident and aspiring artists working with us and with other partners in the city. We've developed staff training as part of this programme to how to talk to artists and work with artistic community um, participants. We had a celebratory exhibition, we had public events and workshops, and we secured funding from another source for a further three years of these um, projects. 
So from our perspective, and I'm aware of the time, apologies, um, the purpose was really about empowering our communities to love their own culture and share that pride with the wider world. Um, we wanted them to create an inspirational collection that reflects our city of Aberdeen. We were commissioning, collecting and curating work made locally. And the whole point was for everyone to see themselves or recognise something about their lived experience in our collection. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, and you also told us about your background uh, when you started, so that was very, very nice. Uh, do we now have a screen with all uh, in one? There we are. Can you? Uh, are you able to hear us? Yes. yes. And we are able to hear you. Okay. Yeah. There are. Um, I think it's nearly 250 uh, participants this year uh, sitting here. Um, so it's quite um, quite a lot of people here and good colleagues over Europe. Um, this, uh, this section is about collaborations with cities and local communities. Uh, we have uh, pointed out uh, two questions in general, uh, uh, and they are free for you to comment uh, or add something, uh, ask questions to each other. Um, it's printed in the program, uh, but I repeat the question. Uh, what new approaches can museums embrace in collaborating with their municipalities and local communities? And how are these museums making their collections accessible to their respective audiences? Does it feel right for you? Are you in the right group? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would someone like to start? You s I, I, I heard that you said this was an election. Uh, in, uh, in, in your um, uh, hometown. Uh, and we can start with that. Uh, does it influence? Uh, is a new political regime coming in uh, after an election, a new major in town, perhaps? No, it was uh, the complete same person who was re-elected again uh -huh. and again and again. Stability. He's a, he's a popular, he's a popular politician. But um, but we we had this new space, and one of our uh, mission was to open our museum up for various sorts of events. Um, and uh, we thought this was a, a given opportunity to open our space up, our museum up for a democratic discussion, but with a mm with a view for the historic, both in the past and maybe also in the future, what kind of identity does this local community have, had, has, and have in the future? So that was, that was the uh, uh, kind of lection we had to force on our politician to keep that in mind when they answered some questions. Uh, Aberdeen and uh, Alton in Switzerland, do you have anything to add or would you want, like to comment? Uh, it's uh, probably a little more difficult for you uh, just to take the word, but, but please do. Yes, uh, of course, I can say something. <laughs> um, we think it's a it's a really nice approach, uh, this uh, whole um, opening the museum for democratic discussions um, uh, as such. Um, we ourselves, we also try to, to uh, make room uh, or offer space for, for uh, yeah, for events that aren't mainly organized by us. We, for example, had a, a group um, from the municipality of Alton, the, the Migration uh, Bureau, um, uh, they, they used our rooms to like uh, form this group uh, with uh, migrants, uh, mother migrants, and to, to give them a like a room to discuss together, to read the uh, primary read stories together, um, like uh, yeah, introducing them to the to the local local museum and also to to other migrants and offer them yeah a space and a room to like exchange and yeah, it's it was a lot about uh, integration for them here in Alton. That was such yeah maybe that would also be like something in in this direction. 
And Aberdeen? Yeah, I, th I think um, we've come up against, I think, project and consultation fatigue with some of our communities. Um, and so you th there's a tendency to, um, you know, every project or opportunity that comes up, we end up going to either the same or similar communities, communities that have, um, are in areas of multiple deprivation or, um, or, or perhaps are particularly engaged. And one of the things that we were very aware of when we went into the micro commissions program was to try and get some representation on our selection panel from the um, wider diverse artistic community um, and we went into that process thinking that people would be you know jumping up and saying yes please I want to be consulted um, what actually came to light very quickly was that we had to invest in those people and in the end our community participants were paid for their time and I think that that's becoming more and more of a challenge going forward with some of the co-curation and collaboration opportunities that are coming up we can offer opportunities but actually we have to acknowledge that we as museum professionals get paid to do this work but the people who are now doing the work for us or with us need some sort of recognition or recompense. And I think that that's, that's a, going to be an ongoing challenge. The more that we do with communities, the more we have to acknowledge that they are contributing and very often they're contributing for no um, financial gain and they're using their personal time. Do you involve volunteers? We do. We do take on um, volunteers as well. Um, and But that's a slightly more transactional relationship often because um, volunteers have multiple reasons for coming into a museum um, or in a gallery. So they may be coming in to add um, experience to their CV or they may be coming in for so, um, socialization reasons, um, you know, and sometimes they're coming in purely altruistically to give something back but when we're going out to hard to reach communities or communities that face a challenge and we're trying to diversify our um, conversations with people volunteers are an easy target because they're already with us but beyond that how do we reach those people who don't easily access us as, a, as an organization. And actually what we've been finding is it needs to be a far more clear advantage to them as individual participants. Uh, Yvonne and Karin in Alton, can may I ask the same question to you about volunteers? Uh, do you involve them in, uh, in uh, how you are running the museum? Yeah. So maybe I can say something about the archaeology. Um, we are we are uh, working very close together with the uh, Cantons Archaeologie, the Bureau of um, Canton uh, of Archaeology of the Canton, solid one. And there we have, uh, for example, volunteers and um, the, the so-called uh, metal det detectors um, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the, 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 the right word in English. Um, that's a, an example for, for a group. Uh, they are uh, working very close together with the archaeology of the canton and also with us from the museum because we are very close. The, the archaeology um, museum is very close with the um, Bureau um, of, of the archaeology of the canton. That's our part. And the um, other part, I think, um, Yvonne, maybe... <laughs> yeah, as, as far as I, I can speak for the Historic Museum, we don't uh, have especially like volunteers, uh, like really a group. Of course, we try to, um, for example, uh, for our uh, exhibition that opens today, <laughs> um, our uh, temporary exhibition, uh, we um, reached out to specialists in this specific uh, theme subject and um, involve them in like um, helping with uh, the exhibition by for example giving an interview that we can use it's more if we use voluntary uh, workers we really we only use them in, in this in such situations we don't have like a group of volunteers that come and help us regularly okay thank you and our friends in denmark 
Do you have something uh, you would like to add, or uh, you don't need necessarily uh, have to speak about volunteers? But I think it's interesting because it's um, it's quite important in the local community. Yes, we are very aware that um, we we keep, we we have to be re relevant uh, as a museum. We 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 must be relevant all the time, and uh, and and that is also a way to to use volunteers. And we also have good need a uh, good use of uh, people working with metal detectors, because um, they keep exploring new, exciting, really beautiful things. And people always like beautiful things. Uh, archaeologists like uh, dirt and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, shades of brown, uh, but uh, but uh, these people help uh, uh, put some uh, some persons from the past uh, 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 in the in the area. Um, so uh, they are great help to us uh, to people to find uh, the, this uh, this uh, uh, kind of pride. We would like that people have uh, feel pride, uh, proud that uh, they um, they come from a, an area where people have been living for a very very long time. Yeah, but uh, another way we try to reach out to a new kind of community is uh, through special exhibitions where we try to pick a, t a theme which will maybe interest someone who don't usually go to our museum. So we did have a uh, dragon and other mythical creatures, which were very uh, school and small kids family friendly. And then the next one is wolf where we know that the, the Hunter Society will be very interested because they have a quite a strong opinion about it. And then <laughs> uh, in the future, we will make an exhibition about uh, play and how you play. And uh, hopefully, again, we will pick up some new, uh, I don't know, volunteers or, or just new participants from the community who would, uh, who would think this will be a great experience for me. And uh, obviously, this museum has something to offer me and I can learn something and they can learn from me as well. So I think there are several ways to reach out to people and your community. Thank you. Um, time is running very fast when you are in uh, such a good company. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for the presentations. Uh, I hope uh, you are able to follow uh, us online from Aberdeen and Alton. Uh, and uh, no, it's a uh, coffee break. I, I don't know if uh, Agnes or someone is going to say something before we go to the coffee break. Are you? No, uh, they want coffee. Uh, uh, it's scheduled until 11.20. Uh, just one minute. I will ask uh, the participating museums, uh, the Estonia Martin Museum, Bolnisi Museum uh, in Georgia, Nordisk Museum, just to come here uh, so we have a quick talk about the next section. Okay? Then it's a coffee break. Thank you.